Welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we will give folks a moment uh, to come in from the waiting room and join us and uh, get, get all logged in here tonight. We have uh, a lot of people who signed up for tonight's webinar on how to price your artwork. Um, the perennial question um, <laughs> for anyone working in the arts of how, how to price their artwork. Um, so I see the, the room filling in, just vamping for a moment. Hi everyone, I'm Meredith Badler. I'm the deputy director at the CBCA, the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts. And tonight's presentation is part of an ongoing series uh, under the name Advancing Creatives. Uh, CBCA is, is honored and delighted uh, to produce this series in close partnership with the Art Students League of Denver, with the Clifford Still Museum, and with Redline Contemporary Arts Center. Um, wonderful organizations. I know um, I see Aubrey's on, I saw Sonia's on. Um, some of our partners from those organizations are joining us here tonight. Um, they help us produce this series, promote it, excuse me, share it with their members, come up with speakers and topics. Um, so thank you uh, to Art Students League, Redline and Clifford Still Museum for being part of the Advancing Creatives um, team. This was their gen, they created this, this series um, several years ago. Um, we have a couple Zoom housekeeping items that I want to cover before we turn it over to our panelists. Uh, we do have a pretty uh, good sized group with us tonight uh, live on Zoom. Um, so we ask that you please stay muted. Uh, you were muted, muted when you entered. That just helps us avoid background noise or, or other interruptions. Um, we have three just terrific panelists with us today and we wanna make sure they can um, take that center stage. Uh, you're welcome to keep your camera on or off. Um, if it helps you to focus on our panelists, go ahead and turn your camera off. We know you're there. Um, there's also a nifty uh, video setting called Hide Non-Video Participants. You can go to your video settings and find that, and that'll just sort of clear away anyone who has their camera off. And again, you can focus on our, our three wonderful panelists. Um, we have closed captioning available, I believe. Uh, you should be able to show subtitles. Um, so if you're joining us tonight and, and closed captioning and subtitles helps you out, uh, please feel free to turn that on. Um, and then we are recording tonight's presentation. Um, we will be uh, recording the, the panel and then sharing it on CBCA's uh, YouTube channel um, after tonight and then on our website as well. Um, so if you're watching this later on on YouTube at home in your pajamas, hello to you as well. We're glad uh, you are finding this content and joining us. Um, and then I want to make sure everyone finds their, their chat, chat box, chat feature. Um, that's how we'll be taking uh, questions from you all to incorporate into the panel conversation. We have some already planned, but we want to make sure we're making this as useful for you as possible. So go ahead find your chat box and go ahead, introduce yourself. Let us know who you are. Um, I think I saw we have some folks joining from, uh, from Denver, from, uh, from Colorado, from out of state potentially. Uh, so say hello, let us know who you are. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my little welcome screen there. Um, and we actually have to do a little activity to get us started. Um, and get a sense for who's here. Um, when we're talking about pricing artwork, uh, that can look so many different ways depending on what your artwork is. Is it two-dimensional? Is it one-dimensional? Is it, is it a sculpture? Is it a drawing? Is it a commission? Um, so we're gonna, our first poll question for you all is just to get a sense of what is your primary artistic medium? So I'm gonna ask my, my colleague, Rachel, to launch that first poll. I can't tell if she's done it, but maybe she has. Is the poll up? Cool, I can't see it, but you all can. Um, 
So what is, what is your primary artistic medium? If, if you are not an artist, if this doesn't apply to you, don't worry about it. If you're, feel free to click other, feel free to click a few, just to give us a baseline. Um, and then go ahead and share those results, uh, Rachel, when you're ready. And I'm realizing now I can't see the poll. So maybe one of our panelists can share what our, what feedback we're getting. I don't think it's up yet. So. Oh, okay, great. We'll give folks a little more time to answer, answer their poll. Do, 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 do. Are we ready? Oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. All right, you guys can all, I apparently as a host can't see it, but uh, Sam, do you want to give us a highlight? What kind of artists yeah. do we have with so us tonight? We have 69% said painting and drawing, 3% uh, printmaking, 11% sculpture and ceramics, 11% photography, 11% uh, crafts, 14% installation site specific, um, some other small percentages, and then 11 for other. So kind of a broad range, but clearly a big drawing and painting crowd, which is great. Great. We love, we love our, our 2D folks, um, but a good mix of others. Thanks. Um, so the second poll uh, that we'll get up here is what is the primary way that you are currently selling your art or making money from your art? Again, don't think about, don't stress out about it. Just primarily, how are the ways that you're currently um, getting your work out there? Are you going through galleries? Are you doing art fairs? Are you selling things through your website, through someone else's website? Um, if you're not selling your work at all right now, let us know that too. Um, again, just to give us a sense of what sort of mediums um, are you all currently using? So same thing, we'll give you a chance to fill out your little poll. This is how we know you're there. Lots of folks introducing themselves in the chat as well. Ooh, some folks from Arizona, Highlands Ranch, Lakewood. Hello, everyone. Great. Right. Oh, we have such a good group here tonight. Some from California. All right. When you're ready, Rachel, go ahead and share those results. So we've got 18% gallery, 21% personal website, 15% uh, third party like Etsy or Artsy, 10% art fairs, 26% commissions, 36% uh, are I'm not currently selling, but I'd like to be, and then other for 26%. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for being no our poll Vanna White. Um, that across the board. I love that. So a little bit of everything and quite a few people that are like, I want to get into this game. I'm not doing it yet. That's why I've logged on here tonight. Great. Let's, let's get into it. Um, so we have three marvelous panelists with us tonight. Um, just so excited. Uh, we have with us Samantha Johnston with the Colorado Photographic Arts Center, Doug Casena with K Contemporary Gallery, also an artist himself, and Chris Roth with CR Projects. Um, and what I'd love to do first is just go back through, we can even do it in that same order, and ask each one of you to just give a little bit more info, who you are, what you do. Um, yeah, and share a little bit more about your work. So Sam, let's let's start with you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Meredith, for that. So uh, I'm Samantha Johnston. I'm the Executive Director and Curator at the Colorado Photographic Arts Center, CPAC or CPAC. Um, and we are a nonprofit arts organization that was founded in 1963. Uh, we're located currently at 11th and Bannock by the Golden Triangle. And we have about seven to 10 photography exhibits a year with a mix of solo and group and jury shows. Um, we also have education programming, a digital lab and darkroom on site, um, membership program. So we're really, we are a center of photography in town. Our gallery is open and free and open to the public. Um, and we just finished the month of photography, a biennial photo festival in Denver, uh, which we are very excited to be doing the leadership of that festival now. So lots of exciting things happening and I'll throw our website in the chat as well. So thanks. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, Doug, how about you? Uh, 
Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Doug Casina. I'm the owner of K Contemporary, a gallery in Lower Downtown. Uh, we represent kind of the whole gamut from uh, local artists to international artists. Like the person behind me is a, an artist, Viktor Freso from Bratislava in Slovakia. Uh, we do all kinds of the online platforms. I'm trying to think of stuff that's kind of relevant towards the pricing thing. So like I, I sell work everywhere from the art fairs to, you know, artsy and Artnet and all of those places. So if you guys have questions around that, I'm also an artist. I've been a represented artist since I was like 17. I'm a collector, I'm a curator, and I have an art podcast that's very much geared towards Kind of the art making community it's called art bound and it's from artist network um and you can find it on all the places you listen to podcasts thanks doug um and we'll be uh following tonight's webinar in addition to sending out the recording we'll be compiling some of these links and resources like um a link to the cpac website like a link to to doug's podcast so feel free to keep throwing them out putting things in the chat we'll make sure they all get collected. Um, and then Chris, who apparently did not get the animal print memo no, for tonight's panel, all. we still appreciate you being here um, without I'm your animal print. I haven't been kicked off the panel yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I <just> appreciate it. <laughs> uh, well, I'm Chris Roth, and I'm the founder and principal of CR Projects, which is uh, an art advisory firm that I launched uh, about 18 months ago. Uh, great, great timing on that, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I love working with artists to get them connected to collectors, whether it be a private collection or a corporate collection, a commercial space, uh, you know, public art. Uh, and, and really, uh, you know, what, one of the things that's most exciting to me is helping artists develop their careers and really really getting them connected and positioned for these these sort of opportunities because you know ultimately speaking uh, you know the more the more prepared an artist can be and the and the better uh, setup they are the easier it makes my job I love that I love that it makes everyone's job easier exactly <laughs> uh, terrific well the first question I have for you is actually thinking about everything that's not price when you first encounter either a new piece well, in the meantime, Samantha, tell me about some of the stuff that happened during uh, Month of Photographer. I know there was like a million projects that were going on. Yes, lots of projects. Um, we had work on night lights. Uh, so we collaborated with David Moak and Denver Theater District. We worked with Save Art um, out of New York and did 10 billboards all around town, which was really great. Um, not to mention the over 50 spaces that participated all, you know, just having so many people come together. We had the portfolio review weekend, which you participated in as well. Um, and yeah, just tons of Zoom, things like this, webinars, lots of lectures. Um, so it made it nice, I think, for people to be able to join from all over uh, who weren't necessarily traveling to Denver at this time. So we're hoping for more in person in 2023, but um, yeah. So it was, it was good. It was successful, all considering global pandemic going on and, and hosting a citywide festival. <laughs> well, and, and what a monumental task for, you know, CPAC to like take over to, uh, you know, on after Mark is kind of happy to do that. Yeah, yeah, great job. Thank uh, you. Yeah. 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 I mean, Mark had done so much and continues to do so much amazing work with the festival. You know, we're all still working really closely, so it's great. But yeah, he, um, just so much going on, you know, I'm still a little like, oh yeah, that all just happened because <laughs> I'm still recovering a little from all the activity. Yeah. And Doug, I know, I know the show behind you closes in the next, uh, in the next week or so. What, what, what do you have coming up at the gallery? Um, well, so this exhibition, yeah, we were supposed to close on Saturday with it, but like we have a big lead time before our next show because they're both like very heavy in installation and reinstallation. Yeah. Um, so this show takes a long time to pack up. All of those pieces behind us are, you know, seven and a half, eight foot tall. There's 16 of those guys. There's inflatable, there's neon, there's uh, installation work. So you guys still have a little bit of time to come see this show. We're closing it now on Thursday. 
Afterwards, I have Andrew Jen's daughter, who's going to have Ooh. his first solo exhibition since the Museum of Contemporary Art exhibition in 2019, I want to say. Nice. I see Meredith's back. Yay, Meredith's back. Oh, but you're on mute, Meredith. I'm, am I unmuted now? You, you got yeah. Is out in my entire apartment building, um, which is real fun. But I'm gonna, we're gonna do this old school, old school from a cell phone, because that's old school. All right, well, I'm <laughs> with you. Hello. Um, what I miss. <laughs> oh, we were just chatting. Just and we, and Meredith, I have the questions too in front of me. So if we, yeah. You know, we can all, like, if something cuts out, we can make this work. We've all been doing this for a little while. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. We can figure it out. We've all, all learned how to be flexible. I have, I have it, I have it memorized, so it's cool. Perfect. Um, Great. Great. <laughs> um, well, I think I was in the process of asking the first question, unless you had hopped in, Samantha, about sort of what do you think about when you encounter a work? We did not so get that, to that. That was sort of the first question. Yeah. Cool. Well, that we'll we'll just roll back in. Uh, so when you encounter a work for the first time, what are some of the things that you think about and consider? Not talking about price. So sort of everything else aside from that. What are some of the first few things that you're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, and I just was actually mentioning about month of photography and how we do. Um, portfolio reviews, which we host, but they also kind of happen around the country. They're pretty amazing. And I wish like more, it's harder for sculpture artists or painters, but, you know, reviewers get together. It's an opportunity for photographers to show their work to book publishers, gallerists, museum curators, photo center directors. And so for me, it's a really amazing way to see new work um, that I maybe wouldn't be introduced to. Uh, and I'm always looking for you know, work that has some sort of story, a, a, it's dynamic, what's different about it than maybe something I've seen in the past. Um, and when I meet with photographers, I really enjoy hearing more about their work beyond just the artist statement, because I think that's an important piece of it. You know, the artist statement is a great way to get that information across. But when an artist can really tell you about their process or the work that they're making or, or the why behind it, I think it's really, you know, it opens up so much more, especially for me hearing about why they're making that, those pictures. So those are things I'm definitely looking for. Yeah, I love that. Make sure you have a good statement and a good story. I think yeah. that's, that's maybe as strong of a selling piece as some of the, the more technical components. Absolutely. Um, Doug, Chris, what about you? You know, for me, I think Samantha hit it. it. It's the story. I really love kind of hearing more about what the work is about. Uh, I also, more recently, as far as like when I'm looking at artwork, it's really been more about kind of a mindful viewing process that's been coming up for me more and more. Because of my training and my background, I can identify things that, you know, like how I, my eye moves through a piece of artwork or composition or color or all of those things are very much uh, immediate for me. What happens yeah. then is I start looking at what's coming up for me, like as far as intellectually, uh, kind of the feelings that are coming to the surface around that. And then I try to even step back a little bit further and ask myself, so why is that coming up for me? Um, which has been a really interesting practice lately. And uh, I had had a, a guest on a, a podcast that like really brought this to the surface for me. We were talking about what is art in relation to object. And we were talking about, you know, the good old banana duct tape to the wall from uh, 2019's Art Basel. And if we could identify why that was art and, you know, what, you know, conversations that can talk about, you know, the formalities of art and, and ephemera and all of those type of things. But he brought something really interesting up is what he really wants to know is like, why does somebody get pissed off that somebody else paid $150,000 for a banana? You know, like really kind of stepping back and saying, why is this piece making me angry? Why am I having these kind of visceral react? Why do I not consider it art? Why is it art to me? What, you know, and like really taking one more step further back and looking at whatever reactions you're having and trying to see where that's coming from. So it, art is a catalyst for every conversation on the planet and it's how you allow yourself to dive in and how aware you are of those conversations when you're looking at it. I think uh, are part of the fun. 
Yeah. Oh, that's great. Why does that make us angry? Man, that could be, maybe that's for anyone who wants to hang out afterwards. We'll, we'll dive into that. Uh, Chris, what about you? Yeah, I, I mean, great, great points from, from both of you guys. Uh, you know, for, for me, uh, I, I spend so much time looking at art and always exploring and looking at new things. I mean, that's, that's just the nature of the work that I do. And so for me, uh, you know, a big question that I'm always asking myself is, you know, what, what makes this different? What makes it interesting? What makes it unique? And uh, it, it doesn't have to be uh, from a narrative perspective or a theme perspective or, or a style perspective, even sometimes it's just that, hey, it's, it's just super high quality. Like it's, it's really, it's, a, it's something that I've seen before, but it's extremely well done, uh, right. you know, because for me, uh, you know, by just by nature, I, I tend to kind of categorize things uh, at, at times after I've kind of seen them again and again. And, you know, I'm always looking for differentiators. And, uh, you know, what a lot of times what it boils down to, because uh, just because of the nature of my work, I mean, I'm in a selling business is is price point. And, you know, comparing two works that might be uh, very similar and maybe one is in my opinion overvalued in the market and one is undervalued in the market or, or something like that. I mean these are these are things that very much uh, have to have to go into my mindset. Yeah well that's that's a great transition because you know I think these are such wonderful examples of all the other things that add value to a work. Um, but folks signed up to talk about how to how the heck do I actually add a financial value, a monetary value. Um, and there are, I don't know how many different, you know, magic formulas by square inch, by materials, you know, minus the overhead, so many of these different sort of calculations. I am curious if any of you want to, to make a plug for one of those or have your own sort of back of the napkin way if if there is some some mathematical way to help people get started here um i would love to hear if you guys like one or or don't <laughs> yeah and anyone I, can I, I, think in on that. I, can, I can jump in if you guys want because i i have a lot i have a lot to say on this topic <laughs> yeah uh so I, i've already seen some people in the chat talking about uh, the, the price per square inch. And uh, I think that that's something that a lot of people default to. And I think that my, my biggest issue with that, uh, not, that not that it's uh, you know, totally throwing it out the window because I, I think that it's a, it can oftentimes be a very good starting point for the conversation, is that it tends to, I find that this formula tends to break down when you're getting to work that's either very small or extremely large and it just becomes mm -hmm. way out of proportion and it doesn't make any sense at that point in time and so <laughs> what what i would actually uh, like to offer just as an alternative and this is this is kind of a multi-step sort of thing so so bear with me if i'm if i'm <laughs> confusing people or losing track but, uh, Feel free to uh, get a piece of paper out, Chris, and, and right, diagram. I agree. Yeah, I have a chalkboard that I can, <laughs> I can map this out on, right? Uh, I think uh, I, I always like to think of an art price in two parts. So there's uh, there's an artist price, and then there's a seller's price to the work. And usually those are going to kind of constitute uh, fifty percent uh, of the overall price of the work. Uh, you know, the, the, the key is really understanding, well, what, it, what is the artist price first? Because you have to really base that off of, all right, well, what are my material costs? What are the time that goes into making this piece? What are, what are my overhead costs that I have uh, in the equation? Because uh, we all know that that can really influence the type of work that we make, whether we're in a larger studio space or a smaller studio space, or we have equipment at our disposal or not, right? Uh, so being able to really calculate all of those, because as an artist, you never want to make less than that in, in any given sale. Like that's, that's really your baseline for any kind of sale is, is that artist price that you're compiling. And then anyone who's ever had the experience of selling their work or working with 
you know, an art consultant like myself or a gallery like Doug or, or an exhibition space, uh, you know, like, like Samantha has, in addition to obviously the, the nonprofit aspect knows that that selling the work, it can often be just as much of an arduous effort as making the work and sometimes way, way more. So, you know, I think that that is what is oftentimes lost on artists when they're trying to come up with an overall price is they forget about that other piece of the puzzle and they get to their artist yeah. price point. They just kind of stop there and then they get mad when a gallery comes in and, and, and is saying that they're going to take 50% of that. And they're like, oh, well that, no, you can't take my 50%, but you know, they, they've really only gone half the way and they're not accounting for the other, the other 50% of the sale. Right. Doug, I'm so really your, to your your recommendation. Bake, that. bake that in. Think about well, I that? totally agree with you on, on the part of understanding kind of how you're, you know, kind of the division of materials and all of those things. I even start looking at artists and I start talking with them about, I, I guess it all really depends. There's so many layers to this conversation. Like if you're just starting out as an artist and you're starting to learn how to price your work, or if you're an established artist who's selling, you know, so first things first is the bottom line is it's worth what somebody will pay for it. Um, you know, you can like, you can price your work at $100,000. That doesn't mean that somebody's buying it for $100,000. You can price it at $500. And that doesn't mean that somebody's buying it at $500. So, you know, there's, uh, there's a delicate balance of how you, you know, start working within the system and how you start creating that following before I think some of these things even come into play as far as your studio practice and how you're making a living and how you're paying for your materials and expenses and studio assistance or or whatever it might be it, it starts getting more and more layered and many a, i've talked with a lot of artists that i've worked with over the years at different galleries i owned my first gallery when i was 23. i've had this like i, I look at the way that i represent artists a lot of kind of this um almost like a an like almost like an artist like career path plan like kind of I want to really know what their goals are so I can fit my representation towards developing that you know some artists it's all about selling some artists it's all about like getting in collections or other things too um, so there's different paths for that um, but there can be some really basic math so yes let's say you need to make $30,000 a year to survive, right? And that's, let's say, after all of your costs go into it. Um, some of that math looks like, okay, how many paintings do you make a year, right? So if you're making 10 paintings a year, or if you're making 100 paintings a year, that makes a big difference um, based on your time and, your, and how that's going about. Now, also think that if you're a rock star and you're selling a lot of art that you're putting out there, you're maybe selling one out of every four pieces, maybe every two pieces. Like you're not selling every piece that you paint right as soon as it gets off the, the easel until you're at a really premium, premium level. You know, for a lot of the artists that I work with, we sit on inventory sometimes for years. Sometimes it takes, sometimes work just doesn't sell. So if you're doing really well, maybe you're selling 25 to 50% of the artwork that you're producing. So let's say that if you're making 100 paintings a year, then all of a sudden you're down to actually selling 50 or 25 of those in that first year of making it. And then let's say the gallery or your whatever representation or however it works, if you have that, takes half of that, right? So, and then you take out your studio costs and you take out all of those things. What do you have left? So, you know, and I have the same conversation with collectors who ask me, why does that cost so much? Or, you know, why is this little painting, you know, because it is a real esoteric conversation when you get down to it. Why is one artist's chicken scratch more or less valued than somebody else's chicken scratch on, you know, on or mark making on, you know, canvas. So, you know, it, it's such, uh, it's a non-definable thing. And I think, again, this goes back to what Samantha was saying what happens is you, you're not selling an object at some point, you're selling the story, you're selling the magic, you're selling that conversation that that object has with people. So the more that you can give them to relate to, 
the more that you can like define that for them so that they have that conversation with the work, the more interesting it's going to be. I always say that collectors at some point stop collecting artwork and they start collecting artists and they start collecting the stories. Absolutely. I think too, another thing that's yeah. you know gonna to touch a little I love, bit. I feel like that should be the, the tagline. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. So um, that what you were saying, you know, I really think that, you know, also thinking about the market as well that you're in. Um, and if you're in multiple, you know, I mean, I've talked to photographers about that who are maybe have work in the Denver market, but then they have a gallery in Houston or someplace else, you know, and, and the market bears a different price point. And so those are other things that have to be kind of considered and thinking about, you know, what is it, where are you in your career? Um, how much work have you sold and, and that, and doing that kind of math of how much do I need to sell in order to kind of break even or make those, you know, make my studio payment or whatever it is, uh, all of that plays into that. Um, so yeah, there's, it's all, it's so, there's no easy answer to the, <laughs> how to price the work. It's an interesting thing that you brought up that I just want to interject on is the fact that like price it evenly across the board, whether or not your galleries in Houston or wherever, because there's this thing called the internet and people can find prices really easily. So yeah, if you're like, sure. if you're underpricing or selling out of your studio at one price versus your galleries, your galleries are gonna drop you in a second because why would they compete with that, you know? So keep it at that price point, keep it at the retail price point and make sure that that's consistent across all of your platforms. And also too, I, thinking yeah. about what you want, you know, to that other point you brought up, Doug, about collections or being, you know, where you want your work to be, you know, not every artist has, you know, some people want to sell, some people want to be in museum collections. So I think that's another important piece as you start to get into selling more work is deciding what the end, what those goals are for you as an artist and where you want the work to be. You know, and this is just coming in, I'm sorry, I, keep, I wanted to interject again. And this is, this is just coming in from like an artist, my artist brain now. Like if you let go of expectation when you're creating the work too, that's a good place to come from. Because if you start putting all this expectation, like I have to sell this work, it has to sell for this amount, it has to look like this, then you start creating formulas of how your work has to exist and it kills that whole magic process that it is. So, you know, just have faith that it's gonna find a home, it's gonna sell, it's gonna do its thing because that's what it is and kind of drop those expectations while you're in creation mode and worry about that on whatever days you like upload to your website and talk with your galleries. I love it. I love how much we're making reference to magic, selling magic and making magic. I think that's just so beautiful um, for a conversation that could be really frustrating. Let's just keep talking about magic. Um, I want to, I, I do want to sort of stay on this train um, because the reason we did that poll at the beginning is this conversation could also look different if you're a printmaker or a photographer that makes a lot of prints and that's something you want to pursue or if you're sort of at the other end of the spectrum and you're doing like a site specific one-time performance installation piece can we talk a little bit how um, different forms and mediums and formats might influence how you would sort of approach um, how you're valuing pieces Sure, I can jump in and talk about photography. So, you know, um, additioning becomes a thing uh, and thinking about how those additions happen, whether um, additions in multiple sizes. So maybe you decide my work looks really great at 16 by 24 and 20 by 24. Um, and then maybe there's two pricing structures for both of those additions. I know some artists have done tiered pricing. Um, there is a book I'm going to throw in the chat that Jennifer schwartz did about, it's called Crusade for Your Art, and it talks specifically for photographers, but about a lot of um, how to kind of get there with additioning and some things to think about that I think are helpful. And I, can, I often kind of reference some of her ideas because, 
you know, you want to think about that. And, and as you make a body of work as a photographer, if you are auditioning, you want to kind of have that set so that as you move forward, you're not like, oh, well, actually I have two edition, you know, you want to, as people are starting to collect the work, what, you know, what's in the, is it an edition with two artists proof? What, you know, what are the goals for, um, and what's really obtainable? What do you think maybe is going to sell um, as Doug spoke to with kind of inventory sitting around, uh, you never kind of know what what could come out of it. Something could go into, you know, a curated space or, you know, I know Jason DeMart um, sold a handful of pieces to like Saks Fifth Avenue, you know, that were big pieces. And so, you know, it's like, sometimes you don't know what those are going to go into, but then um, you, as a collector, I have one of Jason's pieces, you know, you, I know, okay, here are these editions and this is what's gone to here. And here's where the sizes are, where, what edition I'm buying into. So I think it's important also as a collector, um, to think about that. So, yeah. What about sort of the other end of this, but what about if you're doing, you know, large scale installations or something that's site specific and you're getting maybe a commission for it? or it's a performance piece, how, how is that maybe different or not different? Well, I, I think that, you know, something that, that both Doug and Samantha have touched on already is, is ultimately scarcity and, you know, how much of this exists already or doesn't exist. I mean, thinking about something that, uh, you know, might be part of an inventory of thousands of pieces or reproduced X number of times versus you know, something that's truly uh, one of a kind. I mean, those are two different types of ways of addressing that and thinking about it. Uh, and, and I think, again, it goes back to materials as well and, and really thinking about, you know, am I making a bronze sculpture? Am I using, uh, you know, paints that might be a little bit more expensive? Am, am I doing silver gelatin prints versus like inkjet prints? Like those are obviously a wildly different uh, type of cost just right there. Uh, and, and then I think, you know, the, the other thing too is longevity of the piece, like something like a bronze sculpture. I mean, that, that will last for, you know, forever, <laughs> basically, I want to say, uh, versus, you know, a paper sculpture, which has a shelf life to it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a different material cost, of course, but it also, uh, has, you know, maybe it has different maintenance levels. Uh, maybe it has, you know, just ultimately kind of a, a, a shelf life, so to speak, where it's, uh, you know, might, uh, might not exist over time. I think that those are all things that, that have to be taken into consideration. Yeah. I saw someone put a, a question in the chat specifically about sort of large scale works. I think this is sort of what you were touching on, Chris, and a little bit what you touched on in terms of sort of the the, the, your pricing mechanism. Um, does anyone else, or do you want to elaborate more on that? For I don't know when, when who was this? Megan says large scale works, how, how large she's thinking. Um, <laughs> but maybe let's think as large as we can um, and see how, how that fits. Over oh, she says feet. over 14 feet. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty large. large. Yeah, that's large, <laughs> definitely. Well, and, well, and I think Chris yeah. really nailed it. Is like you have to really know what your material costs are first and foremost, yeah. and how much is it going to cost to install it and ship it and make sure it has the proper lighting and footing and all the like. And if you're doing site specific stuff, you have to start like if it's a municipality, you have to get engineering done from the city to like approve that it's not going to blow over and kill people while they're walking by it. You know, so there's all of these things that start, you know, layering on top of that based on materials and everything else. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm sorry, Chris, I feel like you had more to say on that. No, no, I think I think you I, just nailed it. Yeah. Because one one thing I was going to say is like, I, I hear like, I feel like I'm going to be doing like some myth bustery, right? Um, because like, I, I absolutely hear what both of you guys are saying. And I have heard very similar things and I've had mixed feelings about some of the ideas, right? Yeah. Because I know a million artists who do editions and, you know, they re-edition stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They, they make yeah. a different size of it. Yeah. Um, Rembrandt did that with almost like all of his things that sold out of his plates. He like made some new marks on his plates 
and like resold another edition of it. Right. And if we're talking about scarcity, like I, I think about this with one of my artists, his name is Hunt Slonum. He's in the permanent collection of 250 museums worldwide now. Just in New York, he's in the Met, the Whitney, and the Guggenheim. This guy paints a lot of paintings. He makes a ton of paintings. He paints paintings every day. And I was doing some research on this because of this idea of scarcity and other things. I don't know if you guys are aware, but there's over 500,000 pieces attributed to Picasso. So like, let's say he was doing some editions. Let's say there's a, a thousand editions of things that each had a hundred in that edition. That only makes up a hundred thousand of those 500,000. You know, so it's like there, I think some of it is perceived scarcity or there's this perception that we all create of this aura of it or what availability it is. But I don't know that it all fits in. I think there's great, these are great guidelines and those are really wonderful places to start and to look at how do you do baseline pricing. But then it all, once it all gets out there, it all gets jumbled up and it's, you know, then it's all like a case by case thing where there really is no right or wrong. It's, it, but it is about doing it ethically, um, you know, doing things within the standards, like you were saying, as a collector, you want to know how many are out there of these editions. You want to know, uh, you know, what you're buying into and, and those types of things too. And I think that's an important point that like it is case by case. I mean, it, it's never, I don't ever see like, oh, this is how one artist does it. I mean, we show so much different photography and it's different for every photographer. Um, and I think that it, it does, you know, there are those changes and I think it does come down to that need to think about your costs, knowing your costs and what you need to recoup. I mean, something I think, you know, there's making the print in photography, but then does it need to be framed? How big is it? You want to make big work? How much does it cost to ship it there? Is the place covering shipping? I keep looking at those gigantic sculptures knowing I saw the pictures of the crates that got, you know, and what that cost to build a crate. And so, you know, all of those- thousand dollars for shipping. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. I've done more. For shipping to the gallery. Yeah, that's extraordinary. There, there are so many factors that come in and I think you all are doing such a great job of just, enumerating them and just how complicated it is that it's not there is no one formula and that you need to be factoring in all of these different scenarios and we, we've talked a lot about sort of scenarios by medium you know by the size of the work the type of the work is it original is it additions are you also is there another part of this magic non-equation about sort of how your cell is it through does it change if you're working with a gallery, if you're working directly with a collector, if you're working through a website, if you're at an art fair, is that a factor? Or um, going back to what you were saying, Doug, about being consistent, I'm, I'm curious, bringing, bringing in sort of the mode of commerce um, into this equation, how does that change your perspective? I think, um, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead, Chris. No, oh, no, I, I think that, uh, you know, to very much to Doug's point, uh, I think, I think, unfortunately, a lot of artists uh, think about their pricing in these different mediums in different ways. But I would urge you not to, because it is so incredibly important to be consistent across all of your platforms. I think that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, that might have worked out a little bit better, where uh, you know, word didn't travel as quickly as it does now, but it's so easy to get caught in that trap nowadays. And it's so easy to be able to spot when an artist is pricing their work at, at different like price points for the same piece. And it is, it's so off-putting, uh, you know, first for me, because it just shows like, well what, the, well, what the heck are they doing, right? But then, you know, for someone like Doug, who might represent that artist, I mean, you're, you're undercutting the people who are working hard on your behalf to sell your work, right? Like you're completely undermining that, that entire process. And so, you know, the, it, I really just, I cringe when I hear artists talk about like, oh, well, this is my studio price and this is my Denver gallery price and my New York gallery price. And like, it, it, it drives me crazy. And like, I would love to just like, you know, see, see an end to that <laughs> as yeah. much as I can. <laughs> I, 
I absolutely we all agree. agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, I was I was going to sort of transition to our our Q and A. I have figured one, out how to. One thing, to one thing I do. Oh, yeah. one, one thing I do want to add on that point, though, because I think that you know that 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 structure creates a lot of rigidity, and I always encourage artists to do everything that they can to sell their work across all possible platforms. And I think that this ultimately goes back to, you know, your artist price and your seller price that I was talking about earlier. If you as the artist are also taking on the role as the seller, you have the flexibility as the seller to do whatever you want with that portion. Uh, if you need to, you know, make a discount on that to make a sale, like go for it. But what I think is so important is to not say like that this work is $750, but to tell your buyer, you know, this is usually a piece that I would sell for $1,000. That's the price of the piece, but I'm willing to negotiate. And if we can only do $750 for that sale, like let's make, like, let's make a deal. Let's make it happen. Like good for you. Good for me. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Well, I, I was going to transition to Q&A and someone put in the Q&A the question that was, I think, next on my list is if you are an emerging artist, if you have sold zero to date and you want to get into this space, you have no personal baseline, where do you start? Where do you start? I usually tell photographers to start by looking at other emerging photographers are pricing that they might have in place. You know, we, our member show or other exhibits we have, it's always a mix of artists and, and experience level and that pricing is available. Um, and so I think that's a good place to look around, you know, look at other spaces where work is being shown, do a little research, see what that artist is showing their work at, um, you know, with the internet and Google, it doesn't take, you know, you can Google pretty quickly and find a little more information. How much have they shown? How much, you know, and get that, you know, experience. So, yeah. I Other advice? I, I agree. I think that's a great, a great way of thinking about it is looking at your peers, seeing what other people are, are selling their work at. And, and, you know, what I always encourage artists to think about is it's always a good position to raise your prices over time but it's a bad position to be stuck and then have to reduce your prices over time. And, and it kind of goes back to that same sort of thing of, you know, devaluing your own work. I mean, you know, how would your collectors feel who bought a piece for, you know, $5,000 a few years ago, seeing it now at, you know, half of that, they're going to feel like, well, what the heck, like what happened? <laughs> what happened to my piece? It's not worth this much anymore. <laughs> so that sort of thing. So I always think it's good to kind of incrementally you know, raise prices over time and, and started at a point where, you know, you're you're selling more than than you're making maybe, or, or you're at a good comfort level and you can start to think about, all right, well, you know, let me let me raise those prices a little bit and, and just kind of, you know, eventually hopefully hit that sweet spot that everyone's Yeah. Talking. There there are some good questions in the chat about sort of incremental price increases and one of them someone uh, pointed out, Doug, you mentioned that some work may take years to sell. Do you adjust the, does the price then remain the same on that piece or does that also, um, how does that factor in? You, you know, that's a tough one because I feel like, you know, people like, I, I'm also one of those people who always wants to see the work move forward. So I'm somebody who always advises artists to sell the work and make new work and like, you know, continue to make that process move on. And, and so I know some people just decide to like destroy work after it's been around for a certain amount of years or retire work or not depend on those works. I mean, that's a, a really tough one. Um, I wanted to circle back towards what the, something Samantha was saying with, with kind of first starting understanding pricing and I I think she nailed it in the the first part where she was talking about look at all of your process you know with printing costs all of these things looking at framing costs which get ridiculous especially with work like photography and other things and when you start including matting and that also then depending on where you're selling that you know you have to think that that's part of your costs when you're your artist costs 
So, you know, that gets almost doubled with the retail versus wholesale side of things. Um, it's really easy, I think, too, when you're looking at your peers to look at go into a gallery and say, my work looks like that artist on the wall there. And that artist is selling for $20,000. You know, my work is that good. Mine should be $20,000, right? So I, I think there's a real like, let's be very as self-aware as we possibly can and try to understand why that artist pricing is at that stage versus just saying, you know what, I made this painting that looks that good. I don't get why I shouldn't price it for that price because it is that, you know, there's maybe that artist has 30 years, maybe like technically your painting is just as well rendered. You're, you very well might be right. But, you know, it might have taken that artist 30 years to develop that following and to develop, you know, whatever that might be. So I, I, I think Samantha was right. Go see a lot of work, go take it, like be, but be very self-aware of your own work and what, are, what levels you're at and where are your education and all of the things that come into play in some way before you like uh, associate your pricing with what you're seeing around you too. And ask questions in those spaces. Yes. I mean, people ask us all the time, why is this this cost? Why is this work? And and I'm happy to talk as much as I know, you know, I mean, we're bringing work in, we're not representing artists, um, but why is it? Oh, let me tell you what, you know, this is the process. This is how big it, you know, this is what was put into consideration. Um, ask those questions, you know, they're usually people at the gallery watching the work, so. Can I tell you a little secret too? And this is very much like I'm not going to name names, uh, but I also know a very well-known artist who has backed off on their prices before. Um, I've encountered that on a couple of occasions and I have not once had a collector call me and say, you know, I bought this piece five years ago and now it's less, you know, like, it didn't like it didn't go up in pricing like i so i mean yes i think again best practices say yeah. yes don't like back off your prices because that is a journal but again everything's relative you know it, it is who's buying it yeah. and what's going out there um but like i i feel like too that you know there's this another one of these myths is that like everybody's buying artwork with this intention that they're going to like make a killing off of it in 20 years from now, or that the price is just going to keep going through the roof. And like every five years, it's going to be like, yeah, it's just like my trajectory, like 99% of people who are buying artwork, well, they should be buying it because they love it because they want to spend time with it. And maybe in 20 years, if they're ready to like sell that piece, maybe they're able to sell it at the same price they bought it for minus the dealer's cut who sold it you know so like the mm -hmm. expectation i don't think a lot yeah. of people who are in the expectation of i'm doing this to make get myself rich or are necessarily like really watching prices on artists unless they're like trying to play the game yeah. and that's a whole nother conversation totally i mean i think you're oh, i love it totally agree. <laughs> it is it, it totally is I mean, there's there's a lot of great questions here in the chat that are are playing off of exactly what you guys are saying of, well, I'm hearing it should be consistent, but how how often should I raise my prices? And how do I factor in different scenarios like shipping and commissions, which may be different each time, sort of to your point, Chris, about the artist price and the seller price, that seller price could have quite a bit of fluctuation as well as um, as we were talking about earlier, shipping or, or other other factors. Um, I don't know how else to sort of address this other, I just keep hearing you saying be consistent, but you can't always be consistent. And I don't know, I would love just sort of some, as we're wrapping up here, closing thoughts on that. <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I think in specifically about like when we have a juried show you know, the artist is covering shipping to get the work to our space. And, you know, I think if you're applying for work to shows in that way, and that's, a, you know, to think about, okay, if I get two pieces into this show and now I have to ship it to Denver, what is that going to look like? Or, I mean, we offer opportunities to print locally or, you know, work with the artists. 
but thinking about what those costs are associated with it, like you want to get it out there, but then what does that look like to get it out there? Um, I think is something to consider because very quickly the shipping can be, and then, and doing your research about how to get the work there as well. You know, don't ship glass, always plexi. <laughs> Please, I'm just going out there. <laughs> Samantha, I think sometime you and I should write a little book on like how not to ship your own. Oh my God, please. Uh, when the piece comes uh, and I do this and I hear, oh. I'm like, oh no, it's not going to be good. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. We could have a whole separate conversation about insurance for real. Yeah. Um, and I did, I promised I would acknowledge, we, we made a bet, us, the, the panelists and I, before we started this about how long would it take for someone to bring up NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens? That's what that stands for. And I think it was Lori who put that in the chat. Um, we are not going to cover that tonight. Uh, CBCA <laughs> is actually doing an entire webinar on NFTs and copyright law on Friday this week, April 30th. Um, and then I believe actually the Boulder County Arts Alliance is also doing a webinar on NFTs maybe tomorrow. Um, so there, there are other places to talk about that at 656 we are not going to get into the nft clan of worms but um we we knew it would come up and thank you Lori, for bringing it up well, um, uh, nfts are so straightforward with pricing we don't yeah, talk makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah. i love it um well we have a couple minutes left here um any other closing Thoughts or pieces of advice? I feel like we've we've covered a lot of ground, but this is this is your chance. What what are the takeaways? Someone leaving this presentation, what should they remember? Um, I guess for me, the thing would be like everybody's career is so incredibly different. I know artists who went to the same graduate schools, did the same you know, residency programs and are at incredibly different workplaces at, as far as what their pricing is or where, how established their work is. Um, that it's all really, um, like, I hate to say it, but like, I think the most important thing is maybe like to concentrate on the work, you know, and uh, like make sure that that still exists and that you're chasing your curiosity with that and asking a lot of questions and like, and taking it all with a grain of salt because there is no real right answer for all of this. And it's, it's a, like, uh, I know when we first were asked to be on this panel, I'm like, wow, I like, this is a tough one because there's no real, I mean, I've, I know the square foot inch way. I've worked with artists for that for years. There's all kinds of different methods and it, it's, it's a real kind of game of what ends up working for you. And, um, I, I wish I had much clearer, better answers for you on any of this. Other final thoughts? <laughs> that was a downer, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and see if I could be a little more uplifting, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, to, to the first half of Doug's point, uh, being being honest with your work is so incredibly important and and Doug I think was touched on uh, being you know being self-aware a little bit of the type of work that you're making uh, what your market is who your peers are uh, I mean look as an artist you should have some idea of again your your costs that are going into any given piece i mean it's it if, if it's not something that you're actually tracking and like putting dollar values to uh i i would encourage you to do so but even you know even just from the get-go like you should you should have a rough idea of how much it costs to make uh you know any given piece and and really how long it takes to make certain types of work i think that like the length of your time really uh, goes into that as well, as far as, uh, you know, how, how much you're putting forth and like, you know, really, you know, breaking it down and, and kind of giving yourself like an hourly wage because, you know, that's, look, we're not doing it just for fun. Like, I mean, you know, we're hopefully doing it to uh, make a living and, uh, and get, get some of the work out there. 
but but again, I mean, like you know, understanding you know how your work is selling, like who your marketplace is, what are your goals as an artist. I think that all of these are just so incredibly important, and and it's not these aren't easy answers, of course. Like there's no you know there's no quick fix to any of this, and I think that you know from from conversations that I've had with artists, I mean, it's just amazing to me. Uh, you know, sometimes just like how such a simple question of like, what are, what are your goals as an artist can just be like so stumping to people sometimes where they're just like, well, I don't, I don't know. I just want to like get the work out there. But like, you know, you have to understand the type of work that you're making, like who's going to be buying it and, and, and go from there. I think that that's, that's ultimately the, the, end, the end game. I love that. Sam, Samantha. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all that. I think that that, I think sometimes to Chris's point is the hardest question to answer of kind of like, you know, what do you as an artist want to be doing with the work? Um, and and also to Doug's point about, you know, that creativity piece is really important. You don't want to get to a place where then you're not making work because so much of the other stuff has maybe bogged it down. Um, and I think someone kind of threw in, you know, I think if you, if making or someone asked about like a range of artwork or price, you know, I think if you, um, if making that your work in different sizes makes sense for you, then that should be what you do. If you want, if you're a painter and you have maybe small or larger pieces that you're working on. But I think again, that depends on your practice and the type of work you're making. I mean, talk to a lot of photographers where their work at a certain size works really well and larger doesn't necessarily do anything more for the, for the work. Um, and I think, it's important that you do, you know, people, that story with, that we talked about before, having the story about your work, people will care and listen and want to buy the work. And you want to find those people that want to pay what they should be paying for it and not be like, oh, I'm going to get it at this bargain basement price. And, and then that feels good. That doesn't feel good. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, I mean, I think remembering why you're making the work and, and what you want out of it. You know, not everybody wants to sell the work. And so, but some people do, you know, so I think spending some time thinking about, and also thinking about to Chris's point, your market, like where, who is interested in buying the type of work you're making? Cause there are people that are out there. You just have to find them. Yeah. Oh, I love this. And the funny thing for me is after you guys all start selling your work like crazy, we can have another talk about the myth of like the sellout and like, you know, why you should all stop yeah. selling work and like totally go in a different direction and everything else. Like it's so nuanced. Like if you're starting to like sell work, then you're like selling out, right? And you're like, because you found a way that people are responding to your work. All of these things are all like misconceptions, I think. And, and again, the more forums like this, Thank you so much for hosting something like yes, this. Yes, thank can, you. Where we can oh, have honest discussions and kind of explore what the real or imaginary answers are, whatever they might look like. I love it. Well, I think that's our that'll be our 2.0 is how to become a sellout or what to do when you be, <laughs> when you might. So you think you might be a sellout. Um, I love that. I love it. You guys have been so delightful, so thoughtful and engaging and shared lots of good information. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we will be getting out this recording and some of those resources, websites, books that you all have mentioned, we'll, we'll send that out as well. Give us uh, a day or two to, to compile that and we'll, we'll share it. Um, we have uh, one more of these Advancing Creatives webinars coming up in our spring series. That's at the end of May. I think it's May 25th fifth on studio practice, all of those things related to you as an artist in your studio. So that's coming up in May as part of this series. And then we've already mentioned it a little bit. CBCA has a bunch of other webinars uh, coming up uh, later this month and into May and June. Um, so we'll be sure to share those. Thank you again to our co-hosts from Art Students League, Clifford Still Museum, and Redline, to our panelists, and to all of you for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.